Hey, my name is John Williamson. I'm an engineer by trade. I've worked in the oil and gas business, done some neat stuff, and working on offshore platforms and gas gathering facilities. I'm taking a break right now, going to seminary. I'm a, pursuing a Master of Theology degree from Dallas Theological Seminary, Houston campus, about halfway through it. What I'm about to give you is a presentation I gave last year to Dr. David Klingler, who's spoken at this church before, concerning universal language in Genesis 6 through 9 and flood geology. I want to get through the Bible part fairly fast because I think most of the people here are more or less familiar with it and spend more time on the science because I think that'll be new to a lot of people. I'm going to try to avoid technical language so that y'all can understand. I also want to run an interactive presentation as in I've scheduled less prepared things to talk about than I have time to talk. So I want to get done a little bit early and give some chance for some Q&A. Also, you can ask questions during the presentation. Raise your hand, and I'll get to you. Sound good to y'all? Yeah. There's a few times I might ask questions, and I'm actually looking for a response. So if I ask you a question, just yell it out. Sound good? I've got an announcement that Robbie asked me to make. The 2017 Steve Austin Grand Canyon trip is still not full. You can get in on that thing. In this presentation I'm going to give, I've got a few pictures from my trip I went down in 2015. It was a fantastic trip week long. You get to go fly in a helicopter, go down the canyon, get to learn from one of the foremost experts on the Grand Canyon and creation geology. It's like a week's worth of uh, jam-packed graduate level geology studies. It's fantastic. So, hmm? What is it? I don't know. He didn't tell me the dates. <laughs> it's it's going to be this summer. Uh, I'm sure the information is on the website, deanbottleministries.org, but there's space open. So I recommend if you all have an interest in camping, have an interest in geology, have an interest in looking at neat stuff, and an interest in learning, and got the money and the time, it's great to do. So with that being said, we ought to get started in prayer because we're talking about God's Word. We're dealing with things that, are, that uh, deal with God's glory, so we need to ask for God's blessing. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity we have to gather together as a body of believers and look at your word and look at the things we've seen in the world that regard to your word. I ask you, bless us our time, help me to speak truth and speak well, and I pray that you will, uh, we'll all leave this room with a better appreciation for your glory than when we walked in. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. Amen. All right. So what we're we'll covering today is five points. Genesis 6 through 9 does this teach a universal flood? The answer, yes. We'll get there. So we're going to see that it's pretty clear. Well, I'll, I'll demonstrate that first, but we're going to ask, why is there a controversy? Most people I've talked to have at some point or another heard that there is a local, that Noah's flood was a local flood, particularly in the Mesopotamia Valley. So we'll talk about why people propose that. Then we're going to talk about modern science and how that interacts with biblical interpretation. Got a few in interesting people from history to show you, and we're going to discuss what influence they have on how we read or understand the Bible. Fourth, we're going to get to, the, to give the opponents or the opposition their fair moment, give them a fair shake. We're going to talk about what they propose, which is a local flood, the Mesopotamia Valley. I got a map. I'll talk, that, talk you through that. And finally, I want to talk about what I believe, and I think this is the which, which you all probably be new to y'all, is the catastrophic plate tectonic model of flood geology proposed by Steve Austin, Andrew Snelling, John Bob Gardner, and others. So that being said, let's get started. Does Genesis 6 through 9 teach a universal flood? Well, I reckon we ought to just read the thing and find out, because I, I, I'll posit that once we read it, it'll be very clear. So... Uh, I'm just going to go and read chapter 6, 5, all the way through 8, 19. It'll take probably about 8 minutes if I time correctly. And that'll get you on the frame of mind so that you all have this stuff in, in mind when I'm talking. Sound good to you all? Good, good. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth, and behold, 
it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, and the earth is filled with violence because of them, and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms, and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark, and shall finish it to a cubit from the top, and set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every kind into the ark, to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind, and after the, of the animals after their kind. Of every creeping thing of the ground after its kind, two of every kind shall come to you to keep them alive. As for you, take for yourself some of all food which is edible, and gather it to yourself, and it shall be for food for you and for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. You shall take with you of every clean animal by sevens, a male and his female, and of animals that are not clean, two, a male and his female. Also of the birds of the sky by sevens, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of the earth. For after seven more days I will send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. Now Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of water came on the earth. Then Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him entered the ark because of the water of the flood. Of the clean animals and animals that are not clean, and birds and animals, everything that creeps on the ground, there went into the ark by, to Noah by twos, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. It came about after the seven days that water came, of the flood came upon the earth, in the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the seventeenth day of the month, on the same day all the fountains of the great deep burst open, and the floodgates of the sky were opened. The rain fell upon the earth for forty days and forty nights. On the very same day Noah, and Shem, and Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They, and every beast after its kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, all sorts of birds. So they went into the ark to Noah by twos, all the flesh in which was the breath of life. Those that entered, male and female, of all flesh, entered as God had commanded him, and the Lord closed it behind him. Then the flood came upon the earth for forty days, and the water increased and lifted the ark, so that it rose above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. The water prevailed more and more upon the earth, so that all the high mountains, everywhere, under the heavens, were covered. The water prevailed fifteen cubits higher, and the mountains were covered. All flesh that moved on the earth perished, birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind. Of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, died. Thus he blotted out every living thing that was made upon the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, and they were blotted out from the earth, and only Noah was left together with those that were with him in the ark. The water prevailed on the earth one hundred and fifty days. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and the cattle that were with him in the ark, and God caused a wind to pass over the earth, and water subsided. And the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed, and the rain from the sky was restrained. And the water receded steadily from the earth, and at the end of 150 days the water decreased. In the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. The water decreased steadily until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. Then it came about at the end of forty days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made, and he sent out a raven, and it flew here and there until the water was dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove 
from him to see if the water was abated from the face of the land. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot. So she returned to him into the ark, for the water was on the surface of the earth. Then he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark to himself. So he waited yet another seven days, and again he sent out the dove from the ark. The dove came toward the evening, and behold, in her beak was a freshly picked olive leaf. So, so no one knew that water was abated from the earth. Then he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, but she did not return to him again. Now it came about in the six hundred and first year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, the water was dried up from the earth. Then Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the surface of the ground was dried up. In the second month, on the twenty-seventh day of the month, the earth was dry. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the face of the earth went out by their families from the ark. All right. A couple notes. One, the Hebrew word for all, it's kol, appears 33 times in this, in this chunk of passage. I think that might be worth knowing. That's a lot of alls in a very short period of time. But I want to ask a question for you people. You, does anyone read that? You just open that up. You think that's going to be a local event? You think that's going to be limited geographically? Or does that sound like it covers everything? What do you think? It, like it, covers, everything. it covers everything. I'm going to p- posit that it is absurd to, if, you co- if you come to the text without preconceived notions that this is not a universal event. So I want to get to why the controversy? Why do people think that this is a local event? So well, let's get a couple quotations from people who believe that. I'm not sure who, if you've heard of Gleason Archer. He's a noted Old Testament scholar. He says, from a superficial reading, the impression received is that the entire creative process took place in six 24-hour days. If this was the true intent of the Hebrew author, a questionable deduction, as will presently be shown. This seems to run counter to modern scientific research, which indicates that the planet Earth was created several billion years ago. Now let's move on. Uh, we got Dr. Paddle Pun of Wheaton College writes this. It is apparent that the most straightforward understanding of Genesis, without regard to the hermeneutical considerations suggested by science, is that God created the heavens and the earth in six solar days, that man was created on the sixth day, and that death and chaos entered the world after the fall of Adam and Eve, and that all fossils were the result of the catastrophic deluge that spared only Noah's family and the animals therewith. Dr. Uh, Dr. Archer and Dr. Pun do not believe in a global flood, do not believe in the biblical time scale, they, are, they believe in, uh, in old earth ideas. Why do they not believe in, the, in, a, in a, these things? What's their, what's their purpose? What's their excuse? Anyone? Science. The hermeneutical considerations suggested by science. That's why they believe this. So now, now, now the reason why they have to worry about this is because we have the, something called the geologic column and the fossil record. Basically what that is, is we, you walk outside and you've got a whole bunch of rocks out there on the earth, stacked up, different layers. If you go down the Grand Canyon, like you get to do with Steve Austin if you go on that trip, you will see these. It's, it's, Grand Canyon is really great because it's a big hole in the ground and you can see all these layers that you normally can't see if you walk outside, but we're staying on top of them right now. So we got the geologic column and it is either one of two things. It is either the record of millions or billions of years of slow deposition over time, known as uniformitarianism, that's the idea of that, or it's the result of a cast of a short, a lot of water over a short period of time. A little bit of water over a long period of time, that's uniformitarianism, or a lot of water over a little bit of time, that's catastrophism. So if you believe in an old earth, you cannot be consistent and believe in a global flood. And so we're going to talk about what the foundations of modern science and who people like Paddle Pun and Gleason Archer want us to interpret the Bible with. So they, they pr- propose uniformitarianism, that the present is the key to the past, is the base, good way to sum this up. From the Collins English Dictionary, uniformitarianism is defined as thus, the concept that the Earth's surface was shaped in the past by gradual processes, such as erosion and by small sudden changes, such as earthquakes, 
of the type acting today rather than by sudden divine acts, such as the flood survived by Noah, Genesis 6 through 8, demanded by the doctrine of catastrophism. So where did uniformitarianism come from, and why is this considered synonymous with modern science? The father of modern geology is a fellow named by the name of James Hutton. He lived from 1726 to 1797. He's called the father, father of modern geology because before, Dr. before James Hutton, basically everyone believed the Bible's chronology. They believed the earth was thousands of years old, that, that the rock layers we see out there are laid down by the result of Noah's flood and other subsequent catastrophes. Just about everyone was a catastrophist. Hutton came along and proposed uniformitarianism in his 1785 publication, The Theory of the Earth. This man was a deist. For those of you who don't know what a deist is, they believe in the, the divine watchmaker, a god that is disengaged from the earth. There's no miracles. He basically is a great designer. He puts the earth together, and then he steps back and lets it run. So they reject all miracles, such as the things that Moses did, the plagues of Egypt, the Red Sea, Elijah, Elisha, and particularly a lot of things that Jesus did, including the resurrection from the dead. So uh, if I'm looking for ideas on how to understand the Bible, I don't turn to a deist because they reject the resurrection. And if there's no resurrection, as Paul wrote in Corinthians, then we're all without hope. I don't like that idea. So he wrote that the past history of our globe must be explained by what can be seen to be happening now. No powers are to be employed that are not natural to the globe. No action admitted except those of which we know the principle. Now, Hutton proposed this idea, but when he, when he did it, no one really paid attention until this fellow came along a guy named Charles Lyell. He wrote a three-volume series called Principles of Geology. That He was a great influence on a, on a man you may not have heard of called Charles Darwin. Tar Charles Darwin eventually uh, traveled around the globe on the HMS Beagle uh, looking at the various life forms and, and developing his theory of evolution. He had one book that he had, took on the voyage that was particularly influential to him. It was this one, The Principles of Geology. And w so what did Dr. Lyell, or Charles Lyell, think about the, uh, about Moses and about the Bible? Well, I've got a quote for you. It's a big one. Now, this is 1820s English, so it's kind of clunky, but bear with me. I'm sure you may get into the quarterly review what will free science from Moses. For if treated seriously, the church party is quite prepared for it. A Bishop Buck Buckland ascertained, gave Uri a dressing in the British Critic and Theological Review. They see at last the mischief and scandal brought to them by Mosaic systems. I conceived the idea five or six years ago that if ever the mosaic geology could be set down without giving offense, it would be in an historical sketch. And you must abstract mine in order to have as little to say as possible yourself. Let them feel free and point to the moral. Charles Lyell, one of his goals in, in proposing uniformitarianism was explicitly to remove Moses from the discussion of geology and science and everything else. Now I've got a question to pose to you all for a second. If God is the creator God, and if he reveal, spoke to us and his word is inerrant, would what the things that he has be relevant to look at through uh, in a scientific perspective? I mean, God that knows everything, created everything, cannot lie, and he gives us his word. Do you think that might be worth taking into account? Yes. I think so, if you want to be consistent, because if you can't believe him on, what, on the history, can you believe that he's going to raise you from the dead? I mean, if he can't raise from the dead, then we're, what are we doing here? Right? So this guy, Charles Lyell, was a deist, and he was explicitly anti-Mosaic and anti-Christian. Then we get to Charles Darwin, whereas Lyell and Hutton proposed uniformitarianism on geological terms, that a little bit of water over a long period of time makes a big difference. Uh, Darwin took the, the small leap that said, if that works for geology, we can explain the rocks of the earth that way. Maybe we can explain life that way. We, his, instead of just a little bit of erosion, he, he proclaimed uh, natural selection. So his famous work was on the origin of species the, by the means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. He wrote this in 1859 on the eve of the Civil War, and it has had a humongous impact on our life, culture ever since. He was an agnostic, which means that he does not believe, disbelieve in a god, but he believes that a god is unknowable. He wrote, I have never been an atheist in any sense, in the sense of denying the existence of a god. I think generally an agnostic would be the most correct description of my state of mind. So these, are the, these three men are the foundations of all modern science, at least if you're talking about historical science, figuring out timelines and that sort of thing. Now I've got a question for you. Is this a, do you think this is the right idea to, to interpret the Bible with? Because if you follow this, 
You've got to say that for 1,500 years of Jewish history, because Moses was about 1,500 B.C., and 2000, about 1,800 years of church history, so from upwards of three millennia, the people of God were unable to understand the writings of Moses until Hutton and Lyell came along and taught us uniformitarianism, and Darwin came here and taught us about evolution. Does that make sense to you? No. Yeah, if you believe that God is a God who understands language and can communicate, then you've got to believe that you can understand what God writes. Otherwise, he's a pretty incompetent author. So, but these are the God, these are the, when, when Paddle Pun and Gleason Archer write that we've got to take into consideration modern science when we are interpreting the, Moses. And we've got to, we can't interpret the days as literal days. We've got to be, do ages because these guys taught us that the earth is millions or billions of years old instead of the thousands the Bible teaches. Or we've got to believe that it's obviously not a universal flood despite 33 uses of the Hebrew word at all, despite the multiple uh, things that, sh that show up, all the high he hills under all of heaven were covered, all that was in the, therein was the breath of life died. We've got to reinterpret this because Charles Darwin says no, because Charles Lyell says no. Does that sound like a good idea to y'all? Or do you think you might want to read, read a little bit differently? Well, when you're, it, it even strikes at the very heart of what it means to communicate. When we are trying to communicate, we're trying to write, what, is, what are we trying to do? C successful communication is, is achieved when the sender, or the author, if, if you're writing, puts, puts down an intended meaning and the recipient or the reader understands what they intended. If you are, or if you're speaking to someone and you say something and they understand something different than what you intended, was that successful communication or was that miscommunication? Miscommunication, yes. So if, so we need, when we're reading Genesis, we're looking to find out what Moses meant when he wrote. And you look at rules of grammar, there's a whole, you can go look at the, the whole hermeneutics study on what do you do when you read, but you're basically trying to figure out what the guy was trying to say when you read it. It doesn't matter whether I like it or not. I've read it about Mein Kampf. There's a lot of things in that I don't like, but I understand it based on what Adolf Hitler meant. Simil now, I use other ideas like my ideas from the Bible, my ideas of how people should relate to each other to reject his ideas and say that they're wrong. And if you disagree with Moses, you could reject the ideas of Moses, but you don't say, reinterpret them and say, make them say something else. That's miscommunication. That's a uh, false reading. You tracking with me? You following with me? Good. So was, was God surprised by this? By this whole idea? Well, fortunately, we got a fellow named Peter wrote something about this, I think. He wrote in his second epistle, says, Know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking. Have any of you seen mocking about, about the age of the earth or flood? I have. Following after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues, just as it was from the beginning of creation. Sound like uniformitarianism to you? Just a little bit. When they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and that the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. God's not taken by surprise. Peter wrote in the first century, about almost 2,000 years ago, and if I, this is, seems, like, seems prophetic now if there ever was prophecy. So, so next, uh, this is why they're interpreting it, because of uh, the various, because they want to conform with science. Now, one of the things, if you're in a technical field, if you're in a professional field, if you believe that the earth is thousands of years old, if you believe in a global flood, if you believe in the literal resurrection from the dead, uh, you, you lose face. You want, you want to comp people want to compromise with science because they don't want to be labeled anti-science. Now, I put these, earlier I put this guy, the modern science in, in parentheses, in uh, quotations, because Science is basically what you observe. And my claim is that the, the world, created world matches up with what God says it should. That, the, that all ideas that, you, that are contrary, all observations that are contrary to the biblical perspective are, done, are through either, made through either a false premise, through a preconceived notion. Like that's what Hutton did. Hutton didn't come to uniformitarianism through looking at the world. He imagined his mind. I've got to look at how things are now, and that will explain everything in the past. That's not something you observed. And then he interpreted the world through that, and that's what Lyell, and that's what Darwin, and that's what most of the scientists do today. So I, I maintain that if you look at the world through biblical glasses, through a biblical worldview, God's creation will match with God's word. So 
to give the uh, to give the local flood theorists their moment uh, their moment in, in the sun, let's talk about a, a local flood. Most of the the most common idea is a local flood of the Mesopotamia Valley. They reached this because you see the Tigris River and the Euphrates River. Those are two of the rivers that flow out of the Garden of Eden in Genesis. And they think that the, uh, that was with the cradle of human civilization. So they, and you can see the, the mountains. It kind of makes a sort of bowl. You see on the, on the east, you've got the Lebanon Mountains. On the west, you have the Lebanon Mountains. You've got the, the Zagros Mountains in Iran. In the north, you've got the, in the mountains of Turkey. You see all that? So the idea is that that, area, that little bowl flooded up and killed all the people. They said that all the people lived there. Like Dr. Hugh Ross says that God's purpose was to kill man and that man only lived in that valley. So he killed all of man with the flood, except for Noah and his family. Now, do you see Mount Ararat on the map? He's up there in, uh, let's see, here, near, near, you see Mount Ararat up here in far eastern Turkey? That's in the, uh, the ark landed up around that area. So, now a couple problems with this. The first, the, ar the mountains, the ark's resting place was in the mountains of Ararat. Is, is Mount Ararat in Mesopotamia? No. So the ark did not land in Mesopotamia. The mountains of Ararat have an average elevation of 8,000 feet. The Mount Ararat itself has an elevation of 17,000 feet today. So, that may, so by definition, if the, ark, if the ark landed on a mountain, what does that mean about the waters? They had to be above the mountain. Otherwise, how did he get the big old boat up there, right? So first, I don't know how they can under, uh, understand the, the uh, a local flood of the Mesopotamia Valley with the, when the ark is, is on top of the mountain over there. And if the ark's on top of the mountain, if the water was above the mountains, what does that mean for the extent of the flood? It continued. Because if it's above the mountains, there's nothing to stop it. Water will find its own level. Second, the Mesopotamia Valley can't hold water for a year. Most, a lot of people have a misunderstanding that the flood lasted 40 days and 40 nights. That was, there's 40 days and 40 nights of intense rain at the start of the flood. But that's not the, the extent of it. If you see the t from the time Noah got in the ark to the time Noah got out of the ark, it's slightly more than a year. It's about 370-something-odd days. So now there's a problem here. Does, it, does, it, does anyone see a problem with the, uh, with, with the idea of Mesopotamia as a bowl that can hold water for a long time? Yeah, there's, there's a hole in it. It's called the Persian Gulf. The reason why there's, a, uh, the, there's water here is because that's a lowland, that the water's in the lower elevation. So if you fill, up, fill this whole thing up with water, and this, this is about a 100 mile across uh, gap of the Persian Gulf, it'll drain out pretty fast. You gotta hold water for a year. And I don't know of any, any local flood that can do that. I've read about floods that lasted days or a couple of them that lasted weeks. But that's a far cry from more than 360 days. Third, the sign of the rainbow. Anyone ever heard of the rainbow, the Noahic covenant? See, after the flood, Noah got off the ark, and God made a deal with Noah. It was a pretty good deal. I like it. One of the things he said is, I will never destroy the earth water again. He said, you could eat meat. He said, capital punishment. If you go and kill man by man, your blood shall be shed. But he also said, whatever, I, that I'm not going to destroy the earth with water again like I just did. If, if what happened there was a local flood, how many times has God lied? Because how many times has there been a flood since Noah got off the ark that killed men and animals? A few times, you think? Local yeah, local floods. There's been thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of floods that have killed people since then. If God intent was referring to a local event, then God is a liar. If God is a liar, can you trust your salvation? No, this is a. This is not what they're. they're this is not their point when they're make, talking about local floods. But they don't think through the the side effects of messing with God's word. So, third, I mean fourth, in Second Peter, two three through five or three five through seven, uh, God compares the judgment by water, which was the flood, with the which destroyed the ancient world, to the future judgment by fire, which will destroy the present world. Everyone agrees that the future judgment that destroy, that by fire that destroys this wor world is universal. That this world's going to end in fire, then God's going to make a new heavens and new earth and go into the eternal state. There's, I, I've never seen, I've read a bunch of commentaries, everyone says that's going to be universal. But, then, but Peter says, just as the uh, flood of the waters destroyed the ancient world, so that one will destroy the future world. Does, it make, does the analogy make sense if you, if you talk about a little flood that, ki that kills a few people in a valley versus a fire from heaven blowing up the whole world and God recreating? 
Does that, does that make it a, make a make a good point, or do you think it's might the point's lost if you're talking about a local flood? I think you need to have a universal flood to deal with a universal uh, to pa pair with the universal judgment from Peter. And finally, if the flood was local, why not just walk out of there? Noah lived 950 years. He had a he had a several hundred years. He had a, at least 100 years to uh, prepare. You know, God warned him. Birds normally don't die in floods. They can get up and fly. So why build a, a, an ark the size of which a, a big boat that hadn't that was bigger than any boat that had been built in, in the world until about the 1800s? Why why build something that big and all that all that labor when you can just walk out? I mean, you can have a great cattle drive. We had cattle drives in America from down in Texas all the way up to the, to Nebraska and to get cattle to the trains. Think you could think Noah could manage that maybe? Why need that? Why do that? So I think there's serious problems with, with the Mesopotamia idea of the local flood. There's a few other ideas. Some people think there was a flooding of the Black Sea area that what was referred to here, or other propositions. But this is the most common, most popular. And I think all the problems that you could uh, apply to this basically apply to, to all the others. So I've got a little pithy uh, diagram here. If you've got a, a flood that covers all the high mountains, what would it look, but, but it was local in scope, what would it look like? And I, I think you need to have like Star Trek and put some force fields up to make that work. But uh, that's, the best, that's the best I can figure. So I think it makes bad, I think it's bad logical sense. I think it's bad hermeneutics. I think it's bad theological sense. I think it's bad soteriology, salvation. I think it's bad, the, bad everything to try to figure, figure this as a local event. So this brings us to science. What does science have to say? The main reason why these people propose a local event is they claim that science, modern science, demands a local flood. They say it demands long ages, an old, an old earth. Now, so I want to talk a bit about catastrophic plate tectonics or flood geology. This is stuff that was developed primarily, as far as I know, by Steve Austin, by Andrew Snelling, and by John, Baum, John Baumgartner. Here's some great men, PhD geologists. Now, I got a few verses up here. I want to come back to them in a little bit. But, well, I got the first, first quote from Genesis 6.13. I've got it there because I think this is the purpose of the flood. It's destroy. There's a number of them you can put up there, but I like the, the, one of the things he says is he wants to destroy the earth. The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I'm about to destroy them with the earth. Also, an, as an aside, with a local flood... Does that destroy all the animals in which is the breath of life and destroy the earth? No, that doesn't even com uh, complete the purpose of the flood as stated by Moses in Genesis. So now I got two passages here, and they, uh, one's, the first one state, uh, I think details the beginning of the flood, and the second one is talks about the end of the flood. So in the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month of the seventeenth day of the month, on the same day. All the fountains of the great deep burst open, and the floodgates of the sky were opened. The rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. We're going to talk more about these, these fountains of the great deep in a second. This is the onset of the flood and the torrential downpour that started. And then we're going to we have a verse from Psalm 104. This is a psalm describing God's glory. If you, it's one of these things I like to, when I'm up at Camp Arete. I like to get up, on, get up early and watch the sunrise and, and read one of these psalms talking about God's glory. And this is one of them. Talk about the creation. You can understand God's glory from creation. But, but there's a section that talks about the flood. He writes, He established the earth upon its foundations so that it will not totter forever and ever. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters are standing above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they hurried away. The mountains rose. The valleys sank down to the place which you established for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass over, so they will not return to cover the earth. So the water is not going to come back. And I think this, the mountains rose and the valley sank, is talking about the end of the flood and how this ends. So first we've got to talk a bit about the structure of the earth. This is a real basic diagram. If you're getting to geology, they, they subdivide this into more, more detailed sections, but I'm not worried about that. We've got crust, mantle, inner core, outer core. All right. So we got the crust at the top. This, in this diagram, the crust thickness is vastly exaggerated. It, it, you would, it would just be a line on this diagram if it was actually to scale. But the crust is everything that we think of as the world. Everything we see, everything we do, everything we go look at, every time we dig, every time we you know, look at a picture, we're seeing the crust. 
The, so that, the mantle is what's under it. It's pretty thick. It's made up of silicate rock, rock mainly based off of silicon. Whenever you see lava or magma, what's going on is mantle rock is coming to the surface through a volcano or something else, and that's where, and that's where we get um, magma, uh, volcanic rocks, basalts, magmas, and such. Beyond, below that is the inner core. That's made out of basically liquid iron, and the inner core is made out of more or less solid iron. The Earth has a very strong magnetic field because of the movement of the iron around the core. That, that generates that, and that, that's really good for us because it protects us from harmful radiation from the sun. But so everything is on the crust can be seen to be thought of to be floating on the mantle. The mantle is made out of liquid rock, so you can think of it kind of like water. You're floating on water. If you've got a boat, uh, what's what's going to float the highest? Something that's real? Do you think is real dense, or something that's real uh, light and buoyant? Light and buoyant. So anything that's dense will sink, will float lower, and things that are lighter will float higher. Now, there's two kinds of basic things on the Earth. Do you know what, what, what they are? Two big land masses or forms. You've got the oceans, and you've got the land or the continents. Now, the oceans are covered in what? Water. Why, and the lands are not covered in water. Any, anyone have a guess why that is? Because the uh, ocean basins are made out of basalt. Basalt is lava rock. Basalt is, is, fairly, is relatively dense. The continents are made out of basically granites. Granites are less dense than the basalts. So the granites float higher and the basalts float lower. And the water gathers in the lowest spots, right? So we got, so that's, so you're, you're getting this picture of, with me about the, why, why the water is where it is and why the land is where it is, right? Now, in the pre-flood world, we believe, I believe, and so does uh, Dr. Snelly and Dr., uh, Dr. Austin, that we originally had a global supercontinent. You might know it as Pangaea. You can kind of see the continents puzzle piece together if you look at a map. We believe this because in Genesis 1, it says that God gathered the land together and called it land and gathered the sea together. So we had land in one place and sea in one place. So you had the pre-flood ocean, you had the pre-flood world that had one big continent with, with one big ocean. And you had the pre-floods, uh, and there were no plate tectonics then. Has anyone ever heard of plate tectonics? Plates? It's the idea, the plates are that, that the idea that we have a number of different plates or, of, of crust that kind of float around on this mantle and then crash into each other and make mountains and, make, and they rub against each other and make earthquakes like the San Andreas Fault and, uh, that you've heard about in, San, in uh, California. Is there, there's two plates rubbing on each other, and that causes a lot of causes earthquakes. It's pretty easy to find out where the plates are because you just look at earthquakes and volcanoes, and they just ring it for us. But we believe that, there, that as the Earth was originally created, there were no plates. In fact, if we look at the solar system, there are very there are almost no celestial bodies that have plates. Mars does not have plates. It's got one crust. It's, it's contiguous. So is Venus. So is most of the moons of Jupiter and all that. They are, they are solid. So what, I, what, I, what was proposed with catastrophic plate tectonics is when the flood, all the flood gates of heaven, let's see, all the fountains of the great deep burst open on the same day, is that you, what you had is you had a fracturing of the earth's crust. It was solid, it was, uh, it was uh, contiguous, but it broke. And when that happened, you have uh, the, the cold basalts the cold uh, of the ocean floor are sitting on top of the hot basalts of the mantle. Does anyone, can anyone figure out what you think might happen when, that ha when you do that, that situation? What's denser, hot basalt or cold basalt? Cold basalt. Cold basalt. Whenever you, like a cold front, cold air is lower, hot air rises, similar with the rock. Hot rock is less dense and it'll rise up. Cold rock will sink. So what you had, when, when, when you had the fracturing of this, of, of the continents, of the, of the crust, the pre-flood ocean floors started sinking into the man mantle, and the hot mantle rock started rising up to replace it. What do you think would happen to water when it touches hot mantle rock? We're talking about lava, magma. Yeah, you'll have steam. It'll, it'll vaporize very quickly, and you'll have supersonic jets of steam shooting up from the earth. They'll go up into the atmosphere pretty high up, and they'll, be taken, they'll pick up other water that is not vaporized with it, and they'll fall back down to Earth into torrential rain, the likes of which we can't even imagine. If you've ever been, seen, it, seen a geyser, you see, like been to Old Faithful, seen Wyoming, 
there's a lot of water that can come up from a geyser. And uh, this, this model is able to handle 40 days of absolutely torrential rain. Because right now there's not enough water in the atmosphere to rain for 40 days. And there's various attempts have been made to get enough water in the atmosphere to rain for 40 days. If you ever heard of a vapor canopy model, this is what, what, what they were trying to do. There's a few problems with the vapor canopy model. That if you have enough water to rain for 40 days, then you create a, a, an extreme greenhouse effect. Kind of what's on Venus. Venus is a very hot planet. It's 500 degrees Fahrenheit, I think. And it's because of the thick clouds that trap all the heat. So the creationists these days are, don't follow with a vapor canopy. But the idea is that at the beginning of the flood, you had the hot magma, which shot this water in the, in the air, and we had just absolutely torrential rain. And then, so the hot magma is... Uh, is, that, is a hot basalt going to be float higher or lower on the mantle than cold basalt, do you think? Higher. It's going to be higher. Re so when, when it's higher, what that does is it raises the floor of the ocean. When you raise the floor of the ocean, what happens to the water on top of it? It raises the water and it pushes it over to the land. See, it's problematic to get water onto the land because the, the ocean floor is denser than the, than the continents, and the continents will always float higher. So unless you can either push the continents down, which we don't, we can't do, or you can, then you, what you've got to do is you've got to raise the ocean floor. So you've got the hot magma right, rises up, and it pushes this water over. This is incidentally why you see uh, we, all these fossils on the land, because the, 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 the ocean floor disappeared, and the water was pushed on the land where things were buried. That's why we find marine fossils everywhere. 95% of all fossils we see in the world are marine invertebrates, trilobites, corals, ammonites, various other things like that, sponges, because they lived in the ocean. So when you get, so that's why we occasionally have other things buried in the, in the fossil record, but everywhere we see marine stuff or things that live in the water, things that live in the ocean. So we had the, these superheated jets of steam. We've got the, the magma rising and the, and the water flows over. It would be, it's a real chaotic process. You know, it would be, it's not just, if you ever, you know, it's not like turning on the spigot in a bathtub and watching the water slowly rise. It's like, it's very, you have ebbs and flows. Some play, times that you'd have water, land visible. Sometimes land would not be visible. It'd be surges like tsunamis going across until eventually about 150 days in the flood, everything's underwater simultaneously. All the high mountains were covered. And during this whole time, we had a whole lot of volcanism, a whole lot of earthquakes. These uh, continents have split apart and are racing. You've heard of con have you ever, ever heard the term continental drift? Yeah, today the continents move at about a millimeter a year or something less than that. It's really almost insignificant. This is one of the ways that uniformitarians think that the Earth is millions or billions of years old. They go and figure out how fast the continents are moving today, and they calculate back how long ago would it have been for them to be together. And they say they must have been billions of years for this to happen. Now, I think where the catastrophic plate tectonics model, model suggests that these, these continents are moving up to 30 miles an hour, 20, 20, 30 miles an hour. Now, we know from Newton, uh, Sir Isaac Newton, that force equals mass times acceleration. So do you know what kind of force would be involved with a uh, continent-sized body moving 25, 30 miles an hour and hitting something else, hitting another continent? You want to, well, I'll tell you what the result is. The result is the Himalayan mountains. The, the uh, Indian subcontinent smashed into the Asian co continent and continental plate and raised these mountains really high. You had these, uh, the Pacific Ocean plate hit the South American plate and subducted under it and, you had, and, you, and raised up the Andes mountains, towering mountains. This happened all in the course of a year. You're tracking with me. You understand? I haven't lost anybody yet, have I? Okay, good. If I had, all right, if, if you've got a question, remember, raise your hand. I'll be happy to detour for you. So now we're tracking this along. These continents are moving real fast. It's uh, absolutely catastrophic. In fact, I was describing this at seminary. Dr. Klingler had the comment, how could anything live? And my, uh, my response was, exactly. <laughs> and he, well, he said, well, would, would, would Noah had needed a miracle to survive from that. And I, was and I told him, that, well, you have almost two miles of water between him and, the, and what's going on down there. And water is a great heat sink and great to... Dampen, vibra dampen catastrophes. But I do think God, but we, we know that God's eye was definitely on that ark. So, now, how would the flood end? Can it, did any, any of you have any ideas how this whole process ends? Why, wh wh how the water comes off the continents? Well, it says the wind blew 
the winds blew, yeah, that there was wind blowing. Now, if, if what in, in this uh, model pushed the water all out of the oceans onto the land? Hot magma. What do you think would eventually happen to the hot magma once in touch, uh, touching the water? It would cool down. So you have this hot magma. It cools down. And when it cools, it starts to go up or down. It goes down. It starts to sink. When it starts to sink, water starts to flow back into the basins. And eventually, the mountaintops become visible. The ark hits land. And, the, and Noah starts releasing the birds. And then after a longer time, it, it still sinks. This is Psalm 104. The, end, the mountains rose, the valley sank. Land rose up, the valley sank, gave a place for the water. The water ran out the earth, and then and the, and the ark touched down in mount, the mountains of Ararat. So, and this model really uh, goes dovetails straight into the idea of, a, of the post-flood ice age. There was a movie done fairly recently by Pixar called Ice Age. Or was it Pixar? Someone, y'all you, you you all have seen it or heard of it? And there's Ice Age. Anyone have heard of that there was an Ice Age? In fact, if you read a secular uh, astronomy book, a secular geology book, what you'll get is something that says they have about, about 27 cyclical ice ages. They get this number by looking at ice cores from Greenland and, and, and Antarctica. But it's particularly, it's troublesome to get a single ice age. Now, I had this, when I, one of the most beneficial classes I've ever experienced was when I was a new engineer working for Jacobs Engineering. They had this old engineer who was going and teaching this class to his young, youngins, young pups. And one, class, one time he walked in there and he said, what is an inlet separator? Kind of a gravelly voice. And we're all going, we've been, we've been on the job, we're just out of college, we've been on the job for like a week and we're going, I don't know. And he says, it's a sep it separates at the inlet of the plant, idiot. <laughs> so then he said, what is a pressure safety valve? We're going, uh, relieve safety? No, it's a valve that relieves pressure for safety purposes. What does a slug catcher do? Does anyone know what a slug catcher does? It catches slugs. It catches slugs, yes. <laughs> now, do you, know what, you might not know what a slug is in this context, but the slug catcher catches them. What does a vortex breaker do? It breaks vortexes, yeah. So sometimes the names are helpful. So what do you need to have an ice age? And I'm, I'm working on this level here, okay? What? You need ice. It's an age defined by ice. Now, where do you need this ice? You need it on the water or on the land? On the land. You need to have it on the land. Now, there's a problem here because it, when you think of, it, of ice, an ice age, what kind of temperature do you think? Hot or cold? Cold. Cold. Now, when it's really cold... Is there much moisture in the air? No. no. There's not much humidity. In fact, when you see big storms, where do they come from? They come from hot water or cold water? Hot water. They come from hot water. There's a lot of evaporation of water when the water is warm. So if the water is cold, if you've got it really cold enough to make ice, you're not going to have uh, much precipitation. And you've got to get water from the oceans because that's where the water is, right? And you've got to get the water from the oceans onto the land and freeze it. Otherwise, you don't have an ice age. Well, following the flood, you remember we had all these volcanoes going off and we had the hot magma touching the, cold wa touching the ocean water. Would the post-flood oceans be warm or cold? Warm. They'd be warm. They take, and eventually they would cool off. But for a while, they'd be warm. Now, afterwards, and during the flood, we had a massive volcanism. There's volcanoes going off all, the t all over the place. And whenever, it's kind of surprising. You normally think of volcanoes, you think hot. But every time a volcano goes off, it makes the earth colder. The reason is because it puts aerosols and dust into the earth and the atmosphere, and it reflects the sunlight and sunlight, so it makes us colder. In fact, when Mount St. Helens went off in the 80s, there was a for a period of time there was a readable one one tenth of a degree Celsius temperature drop in global temperatures, and that was and Mount St. Helens was a relatively small volcano. So following the flood, you got all these particulates in the atmosphere reflecting sunlight. So you have a cooler Earth, cooler summers, but you've got hot water near the poles. So you have the, a whole lot of evaporation. You have these ma massive storms. So you get water coming off the, the oceans onto the land. And, with the, and they'll freeze in the winter. Water will freeze in the winter. And it, and it won't melt ta that much in the summer because the summer temperatures are cooler because of all of the, the, the aerosols and the, the cooling effect of the volcanoes. So what you'll have is you'll have glaciers grow up very quickly. In fact, you got to cover most of Alaska all the way down into, I think, uh, Nebraska. You had, had glaciers. And that, that's where you get these glaciers of humongous thickness 
in Greenland and Iceland and, and Antarctica and other places like that. So does anyone know what the driest desert in the world by precipitation is? Antarctica. Antarctica. It's the high plains of Antarctica. Why, and that, that's because it's so frigid cold there that they can't get any precip they can't get any precipitation. So, the, the, so what we have the ice sheets down on Antarctica are built up from the flood. I mean, from the ice age just after the flood. Now, how would the ice age end? Do you think? Anyone have any ideas? Water cools down. Yeah, you get hot water up there, but that but eventually they're not touching magna anymore, so the water cools down, and then the and the and the ice age ends. The ice starts to recede, and we're left with the ice cap ice caps we have now. You tracking with me? This, and, and if we believe in the global flood, this, this impacts what we believe about global warming. It says there's only, th there's only thousands of years ago and that we had a single global ice age, you kind of expect things to still be sh sh shifting towards equilibrium, that we haven't reached, uh, that we're still warming up after that ice age. But anyway, I've got a few minutes. I've got some minutes, some time. I've talked about a lot, a lot of science. I've talked a little bit about the Bible and a little bit about some old dead guys with big beards. So does anyone have any questions? I've got, uh, yes, Bert. Uh, I have a question between uh, verse 1 and 2. Of what? Of Genesis. That, that we had an angelic conflict before this started. And uh, my question is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That span right there, before he touched the earth, in, in verse 2 involved, I believe, a lot of time because of the angelic conflict. Okay. Well, I know there's a different, uh, some differing opinions on that. I don't believe that uh, at all. But regard, regardless, uh, I think, but regardless, I know there's, peop there's uh, people that believe there's a conflict in a short period of time. I think Robbie Dean is on that side. Uh, so... Yes. <laughs> As you say, the unrelated to what you've talked about, other than the, the statement you made at the beginning, and I've heard it all my life. How do we know the core of the Earth is iron? How the oh, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, there's a uh, seismic tests. Basically, there's there's earthquakes that happen. And they go, and we, we and we can register sound waves as they pass from one side of the Earth to the other, and we can see how they shift and very uh, shift, and also in nuclear explosions, they make a big impact on the Earth, and you can v measure the vibrations they go through it, like the Bikini Atoll tests and the various other nuclear tests. So we've been able to see where the uh, where the vibrations shift at these various barrier points. So that's that's basically how you get the ideas of the, the, the how the, the structure of the Earth. Because, and we also can calculate the mass of the Earth based on the, how the uh, moon orbits around it, based on Newton's laws of gravitation. So that's the, 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 the broad answer. If you want to know more, you can Google it, and you t they'll tell you better than me. <laughs> Jeff? Can you talk a little bit more about what happened to all the water? Where did it go? Went to the ocean basins. <laughs> Well, most of it after the, after the flood, you'd have big you have big lakes or, uh, on the land, and uh, these this particularly happened during the ice age. There were and there were some number of catastrophic floods during the ice age or shortly thereafter. The most famous one would be the one that caused the Grand Canyon. There was a, proposed a humongous lake in uh, Utah, Arizona, uh, Colorado that had a, a natural dam of lava basalt burst. And it flooded catastrophically th uh, through the uh, land, and it uh, tore up the uh, and tore tore the canyon up. In fact, I got a picture of the canyon here. This is from uh, Dr. Steve Austin. We've got uh, all the layers of uh, you'll, you'll learn about this if you go on the trip. But you got a whole bunch of layers. All of them were laid down by water, except for the uh, the granites, the Zoroaster granites, and the Vishnu schists. Here you got the Tapit sandstone. This is the uh, storm bed. This is the first layer that was laid down by the storm, and you see that under the Tapit sandstone, you got these ver these kind of vertical things, or they're not they're not le horizontal like the, what's on top of it. This barrier is called the Great Unconformity. This is basically where the flood started. Now I got a couple of pictures. This is the Great Unconformity as we're hiking up to it. If you, it might be hard to see here, but you can kind of see that there's a that what's the dock. This is dock sandstone underneath the Tapit sandstone. It they, they, they doesn't quite line up. The docks is, is shifted. So when the fountains of the Great Deep burst open, the continents cracked and things shifted. 
and, and then you had the, the storm beds go over and lay it down horizontally on top. Because whenever, whenever you're laying down sedimentary layers, you lay it down horizontally and then the earth might shift. So here's Dr. Austin with his, with his dice diagram at the gradient conformity. And there's me. <laughs> so getting back to the diagram. So that uh, the great unconformity is, would, would represent where the earth, uh, where the land that Moses walked on, more or less, it, although it would be greatly eroded. See, we, what we see here is we've got the grants and schists. These are metamorphic rocks. That means they are sedimentary rocks. They've been shifted with heat and pressure. Then you have, all, they have these various uh, sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks are rocks that are sedimented out or, or laid down by water. And then you've got, uh, so, and then you've got igneous rock, like this, this lava flow, the Cardenas basalt. Basalt is a lava rock. So what we, what we have is the uh, earth is cracked open. This is when the fountains of the Great Deep bro uh, burst open, and things started moving. And then you have the flood layers, uh, come to the to Pete Sandstone, the Bright Angel Shale, the Muav Limestone, the Red Wall Limestone, yeah, all these various things. They, they were laid down during the flood, and fairly rapidly, in about a year's time. And the, and the column goes on. If you go up to, into Arizona and Utah, you see the Grand Staircase, Zion Canyon, Bryce Canyon, and you see more and more layers. These were all laid down by the flood. Now, so Noah was, would have been walking. So we, these layers below the Great Unconformity, I call them, I think they're creation week rocks. They're, in the technical term, they would be pre-Cambrian rocks. There is nothing dead in them. There's no fossils in the, in the docks. There's no fossils in the bass. No, no fossils in the Shinnemu quartzite. There's no fossils there. Well, the idea is that when God created the lands, he laid the foundations of the earth. He, he, originally, the earth was under the water. He says there's, there's water was over the face of the deep. And then he lifted up the water out of the, uh, lifted up the land out of the water, and he had a bunch of runoff. And that's where you get these, these sedimentary layers with nothing dead in it. Because if that's on day three of creation, what's alive, right? Now, once you get above the great unconformity, there, is a, there are trillions of dead things. So there's, there's great evidence for the flood. If the flood was, you had a universal flood, you, as, as Ken Ham is apt to say, what would you expect to find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. We see this. We see, we see rock layers stretching the continents. In fact, we see that this is the Tapete Sandstone. This is the storm bed. At the bottom of the storm bed, there were boulders with a diameter of 15 feet, way up towards the 200 tons. Can you imagine the force of water that would move a boulder that big? It's pretty fierce. We see this sand, the same sort of sandstone across the world. There's sandstone like this in Petra. If you've ever been to Petra, you're seeing Tapete Sandstone. It's called a little bit different because it's named for local bodies, but it's the same sort of sandstone. It's a storm bed. It's the same sort of sand, sandstone in Burma. We've got, it, it's, and there, it's all over the world. In fact, even in the highest places of the world, we find dead things. Do you, do you know what we found on Mount Everest? Dead things that lived in water. We found ammonites. We found corals. So at one point, Mount Everest had to be underwater. Everything had to be underwater. And, everything, there's de and everywhere we see that's, below, that's above the great unconformity has dead stuff in it. And now there's different dead stuff in different layers. Like the red wall limestone has a bunch of nautiloids. Dr. Austin likes his nautiloids. And then you get trilobites. And you got all the other stuff in there. But and it's... But it's, it's, there's a whole bunch of dead stuff in there. The, uh, the, what we see really corresponds with what God tells us we should see. You tracking with me? All right, we're, we're just about out of time. We got any, more que any other questions before I let you all out? Yes, sir. <laughs> so the question about the long ages between the first and second day of creation was out of scope for this discussion. And so I'd suggest you have a whole body of information that would have to be presented to answer the question. Yeah, I, I can talk... Yes, so that would be something that would be parked, but based on limited information, it was a good faith uh, shot at trying to understand it. But yeah. there's a whole bunch of more information that needs to be presented. That would be in another time. Yeah, the question was about a gap of time between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2. There's a, there's a lot to be said about that. don't have the time right now, but, so I just give a very short answer about that. Any other, any other questions before we uh, let you out? I think I've gone a little bit over my time, maybe. Accommodationists use the gap theory to plug in modern science into yeah. biblical yeah. science uh, instead of drawing from the biblical. The, you, have similar, you have some problems with there about death before sin. If you, have, if you have millions of years of age and things have died before, before Adam, if things have died before Adam, then is death the penalty for sin? If death is not the penalty for sin, then, we don't, then, we don't, then why do we need Jesus? You know, so it, it attacks the gospel ultimately. 
So it's, it's my, my major objection to that idea. But, that's, but that, that, that deserves its own day in court, its own day in the sun, and we don't have time here for that. Any, anything, any last words? Anyone? All right. Well, in that case, I think I'm out of time, so let's, go, let's close in prayer and get out of here. Sound good? All right. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity we've had to talk about your word and how what we see in the world uh, corresponds to what we see in your word. I ask you to help us as we go about our lives to always seek your glory rather than our own and to proclaim it everywhere we go. Amen.